Welcome to today's stop on the Journeys Toward Justice Tour. I am Xiao Zhang, a member of Dwight Hall's Student Executive Committee and Yale Class of 2022. Today, we are delighted to welcome you to Yale University and New Haven, Connecticut. We are hosting Emerge Connecticut Incorporated for a conversation on ending the incarceration cycle, finding your role in local communities. Today's event is part of the Journeys Toward Justice series. Journeys Toward Justice is a multi-school collaboration spotlighting change makers across the country who are advancing justice and equity. The goal is to connect students, partners, and communities with one another and help us all understand the local and historic context of universal social justice issues and the work communities are engaged in. We are excited to be a part of this series, which offers our students the opportunity to learn and engage around social issues near and far while highlighting the work of our valued partners in furthering justice and equity in our communities. Today, we are using the Zoom webinar platform. We have enabled the chat feature and invite you to use it to share comments, information, and resources with one another. We encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. Our moderators will be reviewing the questions and posing them to our panelists at the appropriate time. You will be able to view the questions that have been answered. Keep an eye on this space as we might provide a written response in addition to having questions answered live. We have enabled closed captioning for this event. Please be aware that the transcriptions may contain errors. You can toggle this feature on or off by clicking the live captions button and selecting show or hide subtitles. This event is based on values of mutual respect among our panelists, presenters, and audience. We reserve the right to remove any audience member whose behavior counters this expectation. We are recording this event and will post it at the Journeys Toward Justice website when it is available. Should you experience any technical issues during the session, please directly message Emily Carter using the chat feature or email eventproducers at dwighthall.org. Stay here after the event if you wish to speak with our guests or with each other. We will stop the recording around 7 p.m. and activate video and audio for all attendees to continue the conversation. The Journey Toward Justice series was established with several shared goals in mind. Representatives across 12 colleges and universities hope that Journeys Toward Justice creates opportunities for students to connect with one another across institutions, creates greater student awareness of a range of social justice issues, and furthers an understanding of particular local and historic instances of universal social justice issues. As a group, the organizers collectively acknowledge that colonialism and oppression are not historic relics, but present in today's society. As we gather online today, I'd like to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization in our technology, systems, and society. We benefit today from equipment and connectivity not available to many indigenous communities. Technologies whose carbon footprints contribute to our changing climate and disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. At Yale and Dwight Hall, we specifically acknowledge the indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skadet Cope, Golden Hill Pawgusset, Neantic, and the Quinnipiac and Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of the above as our shared responsibility to make good use of this time and for each other, each of us to consider our role in reconciliation decolonization and justice. Thank you. I am now pleased to welcome Peter Crumlish, Executive Director and General Secretary of Dwight Hall, Yale Center for Pub Public Service and Social Justice. Thank you, Sean. At Dwight Hall, 
we believe in change. We believe that change is possible, that change is worth fighting for, and that in these uncertain times, change has never been more important. That's why we do everything we can to make social change a reality, and why we are dedicated to shaping those who will one day shape the world through public service, leadership development, and the pursuit of social justice, we are on a mission to bring about meaningful and lasting change in New Haven, in the New Haven community and the entire world. From our Yale Prison Education Initiative, it is designed to change the lives and experiences of those incarcerated by offering four credit liberal arts courses, to our recently founded Muslim Leadership Lab, that was created to change the future of American Muslim leaders. And with more than 85 student-run member groups that engage 4,000 students each year, no matter what change you wanna bring about in the world, there's really no better place at Yale to get started than Dwight Hall. Dwight Hall was founded by students in 1886 and is an independent 501c3 nonprofit affiliated with Yale, which puts us in a unique situation to bridge the university community and the wider New Haven community. Uh, and it's an honor for me to be able to serve in this role with partners like Emerge. Now I'll turn it over to Joe Galen. Thank you so much, Peter. It's my pleasure to be here. And I'm just going to very briefly set up a little context for our conversation. So I'm at Dwight Hall an Advocate in Residence. And what that means is in part, I co-run a program called the Civic Allyship Initiative, but I also do advocacy work as it relates to solitary confinement and conditions of confinement around the state. Yale and Connecticut are unique places in that both are really heralded as progressive and enlightened. Um, the problem with that is progressive should not be confused with equity. And I think you see that with the impact of Yale in New Haven pretty profoundly. If you step outside of old campus where Dwight Hall sits, you pretty quickly run into the New Haven Green. This is a place that uh, actually for many people until very recently was where they were dropped off after being incarcerated in the state. It's also a place where many people who are experiencing homeless have to live in direct, um, in the direct shadow of Yale University, and, and there's really a direct physical confrontation there. New Haven is a city with about 130,000 people. It has a poverty rate of about 26%, which is pretty crazy when you think about the fact that Connecticut is one of the wealthiest states in our country. Also that Yale as an institution has an approximately $30 billion endowment, which is the GDP of a small country. In Connecticut, Approximately 72% of the people who are in the prison and jail system are people of color. That's a pretty terrifying ratio that is deeply disproportionate in comparison to what's going on in Connecticut. And all of these dynamics are apparent and indeed heightened in New Haven. So with that little bit of context, our panelists are going to speak much more eloquently to what's actually going on, the dynamics between Yale and the rest of New Haven and their experiences. I, I do wanna highlight that despite the fact that there are often institutional inequalities within New Haven, one of the things that we really tried to do at Dwight Hall is talk about ways that we cannot just replicate those harms, ways that our students can learn the value of showing up organizing and doing advocacy work. And when I was a student, I was a part of Dwight Hall and that's actually how I was first introduced to Emerge and how I first got to know the incredible folks who are about to speak. So I'm going to turn it over now to our moderator. Uh, Caro Scanalon is a tree lover and urban forester, originally from the San Francisco Bay Area and now based in New Haven, Connecticut. Carol works at the Urban Resource Initiative where she manages Green Skills, a program that plants 500 street trees for New Haven residents and businesses every year. She believes that trees can be a vehicle for civic engagement, environmental justice, and social change. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and hello, everyone. I know that we don't see you all, but I see there are 83 folks who have tuned in to this conversation. Um, Alden and Reese and Ra and I are really excited to be in conversation with one another and to be doing that with all of you. Um, as Joe said, um, I do work at Urban Resources Initiative, which like Dwight Hall is 
a community-based organization, a 501c3, um, that is based at the Yale School of the Environment. So there's that connection and kinship there. And we partner really closely um, with the folks at Emerge. And I just have deep love and respect for, for all of you and the work that you do. Um, so I'm honored to be in conversation today. Um, so just to give a little bit of an overview of how like the evening for the next uh, roughly 45 minutes is gonna go. I think we have about 30 um, minutes to have a conversation pretty flow free flowing together. Um, and then there's gonna be about 10 minutes for a Q&A uh, for questions that can come up in, in the chat and the, and the Q&A box. And then we'll close out and have some more free form time. Uh, but without, I just wanna get right into things and introduce um, our panelists. So uh, first, um, Alden Woodcock um, was born and raised in Willimantic, Connecticut and has called New Haven home for 13 years. He has had the privilege of working in various roles at Emerge um, Connecticut Incorporated for the last eight years and is currently the executive director. Alden is passionate about connection, mental health, social justice, and the lifelong learning process that is personal development. Um, hey Alden, maybe you could just give a little wave, great. Um, next, uh, Reese. Reese Kitt was born and raised in Connecticut and is currently based in New Haven. Reese is a student of life, a striving entrepreneur, and a supervisor and peer mentor at Emerge Connecticut. He is passionate about changing the narrative around his lived experience and creating opportunities for others who come behind him. So, hey, Reese. And Ra Hashem is originally from North Carolina and currently based in New Haven. Ra is an entrepreneur, an activist, and a supervisor at Emerge. And he is passionate about strengthening his community and changing the narrative around people who look like him and who have been impacted by one-sided systems. Um, so it is such a pleasure and an honor to be here with the three of you. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Alden to get us started, um, to give us a quick overview of Emerge and what y'all do as an organization um, and share a little bit about um, the programs that you run. So Alden, to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Caro, and um, everyone at Dwight Hall, Shao, Johnny, who's behind the scenes and put this all together, Joe, Peter Crumlish, and everybody else who came out to join us today. Um, my name's Alden, um, and yeah, I'll get it right into it. Emerge is something to me that's extremely special and rare. Um, we are a lot different than most nonprofit organizations in that we're a social enterprise. So the biggest thing about Emerge that kind of appeals to folks reentering the New Haven community after incarceration is that we're actually uh, a certified home improvement contractor that's fully insured. And we're able to offer people um, paid training and, and uh, work experiences in construction and related fields. Um, Emerge was started in uh, originally in 2009 uh, as Empower Enterprises by Dan Hucino, our founding executive director and my mentor, um, and John Padilla at the Annie Casey Foundation at the time. Uh, and they really wanted to find a different way to uh, approach um, Reentry uh, uh, into the community after incarceration and uh, through the workforce development lens. And um, their philosophy was that a job was not enough to keep somebody from engaging in uh, the same patterns of behavior uh, as a result of various traumas and experiences and stuff like that. So um, we at Emerge just try to live up to the legacy that um, Dan and our predecessors um, created and. Uh, you know, just try to be um, a model that really uh, helps to be a place where people can just start to heal from the trauma of incarceration. It's not normal to be incarcerated. It's not normal to go through all of the traumas and things that lead up to incarceration. And um, I think that, um, you know, Ra and Reese would probably agree with me when I say that, you know, we really live by that 
um, philosophy that a job is not enough. And it really takes uh, this kind of community and family oriented um, place where people can pause and just sort of get their bearings and start to hopefully heal from the trauma of incarceration. Uh, and much like Peter mentioned in his intro, you know, we just try to be a place that doesn't perpetuate further trauma. And, and, and just that alone ends up being such a catalyst for so much connection, so much growth. Um, we live off philosophies of personal development, emotional intelligence. Uh, I work with the most amazing people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, and I'm just inspired every single day to walk through Emerge's doors. Um, just real quick, um, we do uh, a typical work week just to give people an idea of what this looks like. Um, you know, crews come to Emerge. We, we work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are typically work days. Thursdays and Fridays are what we call program days. And that's really what we pride ourselves on. And that's the most important thing. Um, you know, Carol will tell you that, you know, our work crews, what we do um, in terms of the construction stuff is, you know, that's never been a problem. Any of the guys that come to Emerge have so much skill and so much um, to offer and so many strengths uh, as individuals. And, you know, I think um, we're really proud of the work that we do in the community to improve uh, the environment as well as improve the stock of affordable housing in New Haven. Uh, but really, the paid work is not the part that we pride ourselves on. It's the personal development. It's the trauma-informed groups. It's real talk, which is essentially group therapy. Uh, it's being able to destigmatize mental health. Uh, it's being able to attach people to real resources that are going to empower and build upon their strengths and, you know, just help people gain confidence that, you know, uh, there are so many options you know, uh, when you get home and there are actually, um, and, and, you know, we have a saying and Richard Watkins, um, you know, kind of coined it or, or, or definitely blew it up, which is no ceilings. And there's no limitations on what, you know, everybody at Emerge is capable of. And we try to just be that support system to each other. And it's a magical, magical place uh, that I'm just like so honored to be a part of. So I can't wait to talk more about it with you all. Thanks, Alden, for laying the groundwork and painting the picture. And I'm just excited to, to get into this conversation with you all. And I like the first thing that I wanted to do with um, each of you was actually like you all wear a lot of different hats at the organization. Like you, you play different roles, right? Um, and so I wanted each of you to share a little bit about the roles that you play and your journey to the organization. And also like, what's at stake personally for you in, in the work that you all do at Emerge? And y'all can kind of take this and, and share it in your own words, but I hate to put you on the spot, but Reese, you did um, unmute first. So I'd love for you to get us started. Um, yeah, again, just like a little bit about your roles, <laughs> um, your journey to emerge and, and yeah, what's at stake for you? Um, I guess it's right the best start like with my journey to emerge. Um, so my journey to emerge, it was, uh, I took a different approach this time when I was released um, from custody. Um, I was lucky enough, I don't mean lucky at all, but um, I had special parole. So special parole was um, where for the most part, um, you kind of get a lifetime, you kind of get a lifetime membership until your sentence is over with. Um, so I used to suffer a lot from culture shock and I kind of figured out what that was when I was informed to the trauma informed group. Uh, so I went to parole, um, I asked parole for help, um, this time and parole gave me a flyer. So I'm like, yeah, here we go with these programs again. So, um, I go to Emerge, uh, I get interviewed by Alden, um, ask me a couple questions. And at this point in time, I just like, I already told myself I was gonna try something different. So uh, gave me a quick little interview and he asked me, where did I see myself? And um, uh, a year from now, I'm like, working with you. He was like, nah, it's six to nine months, it's a six to nine month traditional program, kind of there. And I'm like, nah, it's something about this building is gonna be feel different. Um, and before that, like up, up, up before that, um, I just had like a feeling that I was going like, like, like I didn't know where I was going, but I knew I'd get there when I got there. And that's the feeling I got when I got to emerge. Uh, so, you know, I went to the program, went to the program, 
and uh, I was getting promoted, and I'm like, it, it was funny to me because I wasn't, I wasn't really too sure why I was getting promoted because I wasn't a construction worker. And I think they figured that out real soon. Um, but I took a, uh, I took a different approach now to like my development. Um, I realized that through some some classes that um, I suffered from trauma at an early age, and I was seeing what I wanted to see, hearing what I wanted to hear, and moving based on my environments, opposed to uh, like my own like uh, somatic wisdom per se. So um, I go through the whole process, I get promoted, not really too sure why, uh, and through that whole process, I'm like, okay, well, it feels right, but it's still something more to it. I'm realizing I got all these things that I'm not really seeing the way I'm supposed to be seeing it because I'm not going through therapy. So I tried therapy, I tried therapy, and I realized that I couldn't establish those relationships because I was traumatized. So I'm like, oh, okay, this makes all the sense to me now. This makes all the sense. So um, one thing about Emerge is that they gave me an opportunity to go through all that process and never be judged because everybody around me is kind of going into it as well. And nobody kind of want to say something. And I'm kind of like outspoken. I speak up. I don't mind asking the weird question. I don't mind addressing the elephant in the room. So uh, I was actually able to feed off the people that went through the same experiences as me. And that's why I was getting promoted because he saw something that once I could get this, this man to open up a little more, um, he could use his experiences to help others. And that's my personal tie to the organization because for some reason, I went through certain experiences in my life and I wasn't too sure of it, but when I got to emerge, it made all the sense because now I'm able to tap into my personal experiences, my trauma, and be able to assist others navigate theirs as well as assist me from healing because I have to speak about it. And when I'm speaking about it, I'm getting it off my chest opposed to holding all this stuff in, walking around with it, these things giving me triggers, making me go over here, making me go over here, instead of me operating on basic core values. Now, I kind of missed all that growing up because I grew up in a, an impoverished neighborhood where nobody really cared about your feelings. <laughs> um, so me being, a, me being exposed to that is what assisted me in starting an LLC, um, being a better parent, being a better friend, being a my third promotion in less than two years i discharged off special parole home i didn't have to walk out of no jail i didn't get violated this time for a simple situation that would have been a misdemeanor to somebody that didn't look like me and didn't come from where i came from um but for me because i had this special parole sentence and for some reason i kind of fit the description all the time uh this time it kind of worked in my favor because I'm in an environment where I can grow, I can help others grow. And that's why I got promoted to be a peer mentor and a supervisor. And now uh, we had a void to fill in the organization. And because, because I'm able to, because I'm able to develop now and ask questions and get honest feedback from others, now I'm a case manager for the most part helping others do certain things. And I'm realizing that I had all these transferable skills all the way, all along. And now I had an opportunity to apply them on the other side of the gate. Now I can kind of see what I was missing all along. So I got a whole different, better quality of life. And um, I can go on and on about that, but I'm gonna let Rod go ahead and clean it up, give his spill. All right, Rise. Will Tisdale, our friend says, I'm gonna pass you the football, it's your turn. Thank you, yes, Reese. Rob, but my experience is kind of, um, it's a little different. I got out of prison in July, July 27th, 2020. So I'm from North Carolina, but I wanted to come up here because I wanted a, a different experience. I wanted something new. I wanted this to roll the ball in another way. So I came up here. I got up here like in August. So I came up here. I was trying to get a job at first because I knew I knew with certain things I needed to handle, you know, just coming home. And I knew certain things I needed to tap into and really 
have like a balance or a healthy lifestyle, but I knew I needed a job. I knew I needed some money and I felt like I can do that first. And then maybe when I got time, I can tap in, into my other issues that I need to take care of or I need to understand or I need to just be aware of. So, you know, I'm going job after job after job and, and it's going good, but when they find out I'm a felon and maybe when they notice I got a big ankle monitor on my ankle, I'm getting turned down. So I'm getting turned down left and right. And I remember one day my parole officer, she was like, yo, it's a program named Emerge. I think you should go. So I'm like, oh, all right, cool. She's telling me it's construction. I don't know nothing about construction. I never used no hammer. I never screwed no nail. I never did none of that. So when she said that, I'm like, all right, like, cool. I just brushed it off. I'm already thinking of an excuse to give her because I'm not trying to set myself up for that because I know I can't. I don't know nothing about that. So the day before I had to go to meet Emerge, she called me. She was like, yo. I'm just checking up on you. How you doing? You you showing up tomorrow morning for a merge, right? So I I tried to shoot her a quick little line. I was like, nah. I was like, you know, I got another job interview, and I I think it's gonna go good. So she was like, so I was about to keep <laughs> going on with my little story. She cut me off. She's like, hold on, hold on. I think it's in your best effort, in your future, to go to that little meeting tomorrow for a merge. So I'm like, all right, uh, I show up tomorrow. I, I go tomorrow. I guess I can do it. So I go in there. I got a big old ankle monitor on my ankle. So I'm uh, I'm upset because I'm like, yo, I'm not trying to go to another job that I have no skills for. And I got a record. So I'm sitting in the back of the room, <clears throat> all this speaking. You know, he's doing this one, two. He's doing his thing. He just giving out the blueprint of what they're about. But I, I still have my guard up because I've been getting shut down from every every single job, like every single job. So I'm like, man, he ain't talking about nothing. So what made me kind of really want to invest in the program and what it made me kind of just really like lift my head up kind of and just really like, yeah, I should jump into this is while Alden was talking, he looked at somebody. So he was like, yo, I ain't trying to um, waste your time. And I don't want you to waste my time. But have you ever been locked up? You know, the brother was like, nah, I ain't never been locked up. But my homeboy's been locked up and my family's been locked up. And I heard about y'all, so I'm trying to join. He was like, yo, I ain't trying to be funny, but I can't help you. I'm only helping people that have been oppressed and, you know, manipulated by the system that's on parole or probation. So he was like, it's it's not too much I can do for you because this is what you know this is basically what I'm about this is what my heart's into so when I heard that I'm like yo I never heard that at a job little interview or a job you know introduction so when I heard that you know I went I just jumped in because I knew this is a I, I felt like at the time this was a program that can really help me and uplift me and put me where I need to be mentally and physically so I jumped in, I, I, I had my little interview, I passed the little, you know, introduction of it. And this constantly, this seeing like, like he said, the real talk, you know, constantly this seeing the, you know, the fact that they're, they check it, not, it's, the job is okay. The job is cool, but Emerge specialize in healing. Emerge specialize in building something for the mental and the physical. And that really had me really wanted to invest in that because I know that's something I need. I need job is cool and everything like that. Getting a nine to five is all right. But I know this coming home from prison, it is certain things that I wouldn't feel comfortable talking about with my loved ones. And it is certain things that I know brothers here and brothers are part of that program can relate to. And I can get like a better awareness and a better understanding. And I can feel like, okay, this is not only me thinking like this. It's not only me in my head. It's other brothers that have been through the same manipulation, the same struggle, and they made it through. So by looking at these brothers, like Maurice, make it through, I know I can make it through. 
I know I can do what I need to do to rise to my greatness and awaken my greatness. And that's how I feel like the program is. It's just assisting you to be whoever you want to be, to spread your wings. But it's doing it in a healthy, in a comfortable, in a relaxed state. It's, it's, it's a nonprofit, but it's more than a nonprofit. It's not a nonprofit it's to say like, yeah, we doing this, 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 and that, and we get paid by the state. Now it's a nonprofit that's really designed to heal the mind and the body. And it and it and it gave me the confidence to do everything that I was trying to do and everything I'm studying to do when I was locked up, as far as like, you know, providing back for the community and helping people, as far as being an entrepreneur, as far as this being having a understanding the relationship with people and relationship with my son with the classes it just provided a better understanding the gateway to be who i want to be because you know this coming home you're dealing with so much you know this coming home you're dealing with you want to do certain things and you try to do certain things but you know how pride and ego get in the way so when you got a helping hand and you got extended hands that tell you like nah be that rise to that it's okay we got you it, it just feels good outside of your family so you know i really appreciate the program i'm glad to be a part of the program i'm glad to help brothers coming behind me i'm glad to help brothers on the same level with me and you know that's that's what it is this 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 rising to my greatness with the sister of my brothers Ra, um <laughs> Thank you so much, and Reese, for like so openly, vulnerably, and powerfully sharing your journeys and your stories, and um, also like sharing your spirit of of service and um, like what it means to be of service to other folks who are going through what you've been through um, at Emerge. And I want to give Alden a chance to also respond to this question too. Um, just like a little bit about your role or the roles, right, that you've played, Alden, um, and your journey and what's at stake for you. Um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll continue rolling. I just really try to stay out of the way of these two. They're, they're, they're on a rocket ship right now, and I'm just trying to stay out of the way and not, not stunt, you know, just do your thing. I mean, they, you know, like, this is about people. Like, people want to call us a workforce development organization and, like, yeah, people go on to the union or they go on to, you know, have their own business or they go on to other work, but that's not what this is about. This is a, this is like a family. This is like a human beings organization. It's not a work, we're not developing a workforce. Um, you know, like this is like, this is about human beings. This is about people. Um, and yeah, so I just try to stay out of the way. I just try to make sure that this place can continue to exist. You know, I've, um, I've spent a lot of time in school and, you know, learning from Dan, uh, my mentor, um, just trying to figure out how to make this place continue to exist. And, you know, I stuck around long enough and they put me at the uh, executive director role, but, um, you know, that's just because I would never leave. And, um, you know, so I got my foot in the door and I just stuck around, but um, yeah, no, I just try to make sure that everybody, um, I just, I just try to hear everybody. I just try to hear everybody at Emerge. That's all I try to do is, is hear everybody, learn from everybody, and just try to um, uphold the legacy and the standards that I was taught, that I was given a chance to, you know, be a part of. Um, it's a, it's, we, we have to hold ourselves to a really high standard in this town. You know, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard than any other construction company or any other um, nonprofit serving folks without criminal records or whatever, because the stigma is so entrenched in what, you know, this, this world is based on white supremacy and, and racism and, and just systemic, um, you know, it, disadvantages. I mean, it's just, it's just ingrained. And I think that, you know, that we could be, uh, uh, that we could be a place where somebody feels safe, uh, maybe for the first time in a long time that's like the best possible outcome that we could possibly have. There's something so healing about being in a place where you feel safe. We were in Real Talk a couple of weeks ago and Rich, who isn't here, but um, cause 
he's doing all the meetings these days. I got to give him a break. Um, he's another peer mentor and supervisor at Emerge. And he like interrupted real talk in the middle of people talking because he was just inspired. And he just said, raise your hand if you feel safe right now. And I'm talking, we got dudes like, you know, like guys that just got home, you know, tough, you know, everybody looks tough, everybody's tough guy, whatever. But when you're at Emerge, you can let that go. You can just be, you can just be like, like Reese talked about his somatic wisdom and not, and going against that, you know, and we all do that. Like I do that myself and just being in tune with yourself, in tune with your body and comfortable with yourself. And being able to just let your guard down and be vulnerable, as you said, Carol, and the strength in that and the opportunities that come from being vulnerable. Uh, and when he said that, everybody raised it. No one looked around to see, oh, who's going to raise their hand? Everybody just raised their hand automatically because this is a place where we we hold it sacred, you know? And um, and so, yeah, that's, that's all I try to do is just be uh, a part of the team, you know? Reese got his hand up, though. I knew he was going to, oh, I got to say, I knew he was going to do this one. Like, and it's, it's hard for me to take this. Rock, let me rock. Like, um, like this brother saved lives, you know? Um, And I can speak, I can say I'm speaking for myself, but I'll be lying. I'm speaking for the men now. I speak to every morning. I come to this building early in the morning before he get there, bring this man a cup of coffee, not because he's the director, none of that. Um, This man truly cares. I watch this man stress himself out worrying about my stuff. I watch this man stress himself out worrying about anybody else's stuff. Um, <laughs> like, it's, just, it's, it's different. And coming from where I come from and just having a bad experience with people that just don't look like me, um, it's like every day, like, every day when you think you want to believe that he not on your side, he just do something to show you that, yo, like, this is loyalty. Like, this man give me a whole different understanding of what love really is. Um, when I got stuff going on, I could call out. He'd tell me, don't worry about it. I'm worrying about coming in. He's sending me home. Do what you got to deal with. Um, and you don't get that at no program. Damn sure ain't getting out of work. Excuse my language. Um, but you might get that with your family, though. Um, they see you for who you is, what you went through, and where you're trying to go, and assisting in that. This man don't let people drive his car to get their license. His car to get their license. Like, I don't know where you find that at. So, when he's sitting here acting like he's out of the way, nah, brother, you turn what they consider criminals um, into uh, life coaches. Because you saw that we had the ability to associate and talk to other people in a language that you didn't understand. But now you speak the language better than us. They're going to start thinking you have black, over. Um... And just going on and going on how he just, like, really truly take the time off to make sure that we get in the, get in everything and then some, even when he, like, take the time off, be like, yo, bro, you got to open up more. Like, you got to open up more. You got to open up more. You got, you become more effective with the guys. And I don't know where, where I come from. That's a friend. That's a blessing all within itself. And I think that sometimes like, you really got to sit and just bask in that order man, because you save lives, you and it's not because you get paid for it. And I don't do the money. You would go, you probably, you probably go make a whole lot more money doing something else. You're just scooping some stuff. Um, and like I know, like I said, I want everybody to know this thing that I know I appreciate you. And I'm pretty sure the brothers that got there appreciate you as well, too. That's why we ride. But, yeah, and I, I got to learn how to take a compliment, so thank you. But the thing is, like, that's what I got when I got to Emerge. You know, Emerge gave me a home when I didn't know who I was what I wanted in life. I learned everything I know, you know, like Dan raised me. Like, you know, I was a baby when I got to emerge, but you know what I mean? So, I mean, you got to just pass that on. Same way you take what you got at emerge and you pass it on to the next person. That's what everybody's trying to do. And our motto at emerge, I'm not wearing the sweater right now, but it says each one teach one on the back. Cause that's it. Like, that's all this is, man. Everybody's got, Rich, I keep, Rich, I got to like pay Rich for this. I got to give him 10%. But um, he, he says he's a jewel thief. He's a jewel thief because every time someone drops a piece of wisdom and Carol got to join us for Real Talk last week. Um, so she even said it too in her own way. Mm-hmm. 
of just like, wow, there's so much wisdom in this room right now. I've been sitting in real talk for eight years, over eight years. Like imagine the wisdom that I got just from soaking up that stuff from everybody. But yeah, anyway, thank you, Reese. Love you, bro. Love you more. And I know Ra is just like jumping in, um, wants, wants to say something. Mm-hmm. And I guess like, I want you to say whatever you have to say. And I also, like we've been talking about family and love and healing which is maybe like not something that I don't know we're like used to talking about in spaces like this or even at organizations but I I've I've heard people at Emerge talk about like that being some of the secret sauce like the stuff that makes Emerge stand out and be different than any place else they've ever been a part of Um, and I wonder like maybe Ra you're gonna get into this but just like some of the like specific things, like even talking about real talk, like what is real talk? Like, and why is that so important to what y'all do and your model? And like, what are some of the other tools that y'all as coaches and supervisors share with some of the folks that come through your program, right? That come to Emerge's doors um, and help them get through and heal. So Ra, you can take that question or go in a totally different direction. No, nah, no, nah, I take that question. That's a that's a great question. Um, real talk is you know somebody pick a topic. It's every Friday, and it is it provides somebody the time to just reflect. You know, it it provides time for you know a person to just release their feelings and ideas to the air, and it provides an understanding. It provides a healing. It provides closure. So you know, a lot of times. You know, like the brother, you know, Reese was saying, we don't have time to really talk it out. We don't have time to really collect our thoughts because we're in the fast life or we just move it so fast or we don't want to look weak or we don't want to expose nothing to another person that would bring danger to ourselves. So a lot of brothers, including myself, look forward to Friday because it's just a time where we get this half therapy, you know, what, against people that we trust and again and what people that we can really have you know a generated care for a really bond for it just provides so much intel and, and there's so much healing for the body and mind it all works in one unit with um real talk we have something else called the parenting class so you know the parenting class is designed you know on the basis just for like raising kids but it goes much it goes so much deeper than that. You know, with a parent in class, we're, we're really speaking on communication. We're really speaking on this paying attention to somebody's emotion and somebody's needs and filling their cup. And, you know, when I say by filling the cup, you know, you know, every everybody, you know, here and there just need a light. Everybody in there just need, you know, a bigs up. Everybody just need their time to just feel appreciated. But, you know, about us living life and us moving so fast, we might miss that. So this class is really highlighting this, how to build and how to establish and how to keep a connect, healthy relationship so you can have a healthy life. So you won't be passing down trauma that you're not aware of. So you won't be passing down heartache and depression that you're not aware of. We have another class called trauma class, what Reese was speaking about a little bit earlier with this understanding your feelings, understanding what you've been through, understanding why you move the way you move and how to control it better, how to, how to move in and out and understand that this is who you are, this is what happened, but it's how you come better. We have, um, excuse me, we have, we have real talk, we have the trauma class, we had a parent in class. We got a cooking class coming up. I'm excited about the cooking class because I, I want to get in, in the food business. But we have a cooking class coming up that's really discussing not only just how to cook, but just how to be healthy with your cooking. And then, you know, how to be healthy with the mind and the body. How to, you know, realize what's going into your body, what you're digesting in your body, and how to can fit your body. And you know, wherever it goes into the body, it leads up to the mind. So you already know that's one unit put together. So we, we just have a lot of things that just designed to just make you a better man or a better woman. 
and it puts you in the position. Mm -hmm. We're providing love and understanding, and that just goes so far. This, this with the real talk, this having the ear. It's so much blessing just having the ear. It's so much blessing just hearing somebody just listen to you and appreciate what you're saying and, and providing the healthy feedback. It's a great Let me move. Let me punch in right quick, bro. I got you, boy. Um, <laughs> I got you. You know, we're going we to we keep this, like, we're going to keep this, we're going to keep this authentic, man. So, um, Real talk, right? So um, we get a topic, and depending on where you at, it, 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 it's uncomfortable, but it's comfortable at the same time because you don't get a chance to try to make nothing up. You got to speak from a, 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 a place of authenticity. Like, you got to express yourself because that's just the standard. That's just, that's just the standard there. And you can't front because everybody in there went through a similar experience. So the best thing to do is just keep it a band because somebody gonna call you on it because we can push back. So just imagine you having a topic and you seeing things one way. And by the time it didn't touch six or seven people, you done got seven different perspectives on it to the point where you're looking at what you just seen totally different. And I think that's the master life because life's gonna happen. You can't change that. It's all about how you take on the situations and how you allow the situations to affect your day-to-day -day movement. Um, and that's critical within itself. We teach people to listen to get an understanding, opposed to listen and reply. Because when you reply within seconds, you're trying to defend something, you're trying to trying to avoid something, trying to shake something. No, you don't want to be vulnerable. And we got this, we got this saying there. I don't know who coined it, who who, who made it, but I know we all agree to it because we're a family. Um, we move in, we move in unison. Uh, and it's like it kind of goes. <clears throat> Kind of lost my thought right there. Uh, it kind of goes like where oh, I lost my thought, Ben. I lost my thought, Ben. Um, I'm all over the place right now. But so for the most part, you're like great, you're great. listen, Leah, I got it. I, I'm, I got it. Um, mental push-ups. Uh, when you when you when you sit there again and understanding, when you sit there listening again and understanding the pose of replying, what what happens in that what happens in that moment is that you kind of like you have no two but to alter your way of thinking and how you felt and how you felt about it and that's just all it's authentic like that is so healing like for you to become comfortable with being uncomfortable and you'd be vulnerable to grow because if you comfortable all the time and everybody around you telling you yeah they nothing wrong with it you're gonna keep being the same person you was the last time you showed up around people so if the collective people around you are constantly growing you have to but to grow as well and that's what makes that unit the way that's what makes that unit that unit and that's what is is you you really can't replicate it unless you really, you can't it's it's, it's replicate it's, it's it's replicatable, but it's only with that format because the core principles is always being established. Everybody's doing it for you to tell for you to be able to communicate with your boss that yo bro I don't know I think he might have dressed out a little different, and he actually hear you like you know what I ain't see it like that good looking because we know we don't all speak the same language. We don't speak the same language, but with communication, I can understand at least what you were trying to say. And that's critical for growth and development all within itself, man. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the I think that's the for the, for the most part the knack on real talk though. Thanks guys for yeah, for going deep with the that question about real talk. And I'm also I'm looking at the clock. I can't believe it. It's we've got 10 minutes left of the formal conversation. And I know there are some questions that have come in in the chat. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to look at them and read some of them out loud. And I think that we can, like y'all can tag team some of them. Um, but like this question, um, we kind of got at it a little bit, but I'm going to read it and then add on to it. So Leighton Johnson asks, what are the most important needs of someone when they come home from incarceration? that really needs to be funded to assist to a smoother transition to society. So I'm gonna build on that and say like, what ideally in your imagination, like would reentry look like? Like, and how are being people being supported? Like what, what does reentry look like when it's being done really well? Um, and I like, know. yeah, so. I don't know who so, wants to take that. Yeah, Reese, go for it. I, I'm, yeah, I got, I got to with this. Um, I love you, Layton. Um, listen, right, bro. So 
I'm gonna definitely go with opportunities and resources. Um, but before the opportunity and resource, we need shelter. Now go hierarchy. Most people don't even know what where I came from. I didn't know that was even a thing. I ain't, I'm surprised we was able to operate with the things that we had. So if you give it those things, oh, it's on. You're gonna get entrepreneurs. You're gonna get healers. You're gonna get a whole bunch of other stuff that you wouldn't have got if you know certain things are just put together because our survival mode kicks in when we don't have these things. We ain't know about that. Now we know these things and we can kind of lean on it. Um, it assists us in growing. Uh, I would say one of the biggest things for funding is, um, and so for the funding part, as well as how the uh, re, uh, re re-entry process should kind of go, even starting from prison. Um, first of all, it should be mandatory if you have to stop at the door like a merge. Because for some reason, you go from level five, level four, level three, level two. As your level drop, you get you get put around people that's more likely to reoffend because they didn't even go through certain processes and they're on their way home. Those are like all like the little stupid little petty crimes. So now you fraternizing in a dorm setting. This is, you, got, you got to see this. You're fraternizing in a dorm setting. Everybody's a master at their crime and they're sending you home to that. So you're going home. Even if you did your whole time in level five, when you're reflecting by yourself, level four, reflecting by yourself, three, you're around dudes that want to go home, kind of go home, kind of get you right. But then you get thrown in a dorm setting around people that are all thinking about a whole bunch of stupid, stupid ideas. It's only a matter of time if you go home with a stupid idea and you act on that stupid idea in the environment that you have, um, put you right back in the environment you came from. This is why the recidivism in the rate at emerge is totally different because that ain't going on there. We push you to be the best version of you. So when you sit here and look at it from a different point of view, why we ain't go the other way up? Why we why why we why we not putting people that got similar crimes amongst each other? and showing them the transferable skills in that arena, per se, they could go home and monetize their skills and their craft and might even find a passion behind it. Um, and you're giving somebody a certification and an opportunity to create their own resources so that nobody's needing food stamps or Section 8 or housing because they ain't giving that to us anyway and you don't keep it a bit. But you could give it somebody that pride to go get it on itself because here they are, life experience is not up in vain, they get a certificate, you making them get it. They sitting in the dorm all day, dorm, and they get to go home and maybe change it. They, they can start to begin to change their life on their own. And there's different little avenues. You can sit there and help 10 friends. You can make them help 10 people. You help 10 people, man, we're going we gonna to cut the cost of the uh, certificate we gave you. Or if you help 10 people, we can get you a little job. Or mm. you pop out and merge, or then to find a way to get you around somebody else to help you do some stuff with something you're trying to do. It's just that simple, and that's mm. the vibe. Yeah, Please, I just want to. Yeah, I just want to add a couple things because, like, I think um, part of that question, like, is so. I mean, I just think like a little bit further upstream. You know, like we need to reimagine the kind of experience that people who fall into the criminal justice system have, and and even before that. I mean, um, I think you know, dealing, like, given what the criminal justice system, the impact that has on human beings and the statistics around that, we know that, you know, a majority of folks who come home will reoffend and go, go back to incarceration. So we know off rip that, you know, the criminal justice system doesn't do much to help an individual, you know, heal and, and go on a different path. It actually perpetuates a lot of that, that, you know, um, anti-social in the context of like a, um, you know, a community uh, behavior. And it goes against the somatic wisdom that we were talking about before that's inherent and it just goes against humanity. Um, so when you have a system that dehumanizes folks and then, you know, we're given that as the, okay, how, what's a perfect reentry look like now that we've dehumanized these folks? You know what I mean? Like, it's more about, okay, so what if we didn't dehumanize folks and we didn't have the cards that were dealt in the reentry world, right? Because a lot of times what funders and what folks want us to do is fix somebody, you know, in like six months. It's ridiculous. Like, first of all, and nothing we can do to fix 
anything. All we can do is be an ear. All we can do is be a place to just, you know, try to just restore integrity and humanity as Reese said on another special that we did, you know, that, that integrity is what you lose when you, when you're in the criminal justice system. So like just restoring that is like ideal. Like if somebody can restore their uh, integrity, humanity, self-worth, um, mental health, like that's an ideal reentry to heal and recover from incarceration. And what we're seeing now in many states, I'm sure, and in Connecticut, who has done a lot of great work to limit the number of folks incarcerated and stuff like that, we have to have equitable resources and stuff for folks coming home. Because when we, we talked a lot about equity in the past 365 days, everybody here has been part of those conversations. If you're in this webinar, you've been part of those conversations. Um, but we need equitable approaches to folks coming home from incarceration, which is one of the most dehumanizing experiences you could possibly have as a human being. So understanding the damage that's being done to communities, to the public health, to families, to kids, you know, to um, significant others, moms, dads, you know, by having a loved one incarcerated, like, we have to be responsive to the unique needs of that individual and just be and, and pour money into rehabilitating and, and helping uh, develop support systems around individuals. So I, I'd like to see a lot of the money that's being saved from shutting places like Northern reinvested, uh, as Joe said before the call, into that healing process. Because Emerge has a 12% recidivism rate at two years. Something's working here. People aren't going back to prison. So how do we maximize that? How do we do that at a community level, at a state level, at a countrywide level, and just be, and start it way earlier, you know, in the criminal justice system, you know, like let's, let's reimagine how we do this in the first place. Thank you, Alden, for, yeah, for just like reminding us of the root, like we haven't even talked about the root causes of incarceration so much until just now. I, I know that Ra, you were like ready to pop in and say something and I'm going to let you dive in in a sec. I also just want to let folks know that we're going to keep this conversation going for another 15 minutes because, uh, and keep it recording because we've still got 73 minutes or folks on the call um, and a lot of things still left to talk about. So um, yeah, if you can hang with us, we'd love for you to stay. Um, and we'll, we'll keep this going until 7.15. Um, and Ra, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you dive in because I know you are ready to share something. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with, with the two brothers. You, we need, we need to meet a person at their base and not on studies. A lot of times people just go off studies, but me and you both know that me and you not the same. So I can't, I can't heal the both of us just by going off your studies. We need more broken. We need more programs that's gonna provide a healing. We need more programs to provide an understanding. We need more programs to provide love. We need more programs that's gonna meet you at where you at and bring you into a healthy, comfortable state. Because a lot, a lot of times, brothers and sisters come home, they're scared to death. You know what I'm saying? They, they've been trapped in one state of mind and they've been trapped in one state of life and that's all they know. So then when they come home, they're in a the broader world. So you know how people is, they adapt to patterns and they adapt to what feels comfortable. So they're coming out here in a wide open world and they're still in prison time. So they're doing things and it may look like to the blind eye that they're lashing out but they're doing things that they feel comfortable in their own space. And like the brother was saying, they go right back to prison. So now we got a, a system that design and, and get risks off going in and going out, going in and going out. So we need to really design a, a system that er, if everybody's saying they're really passionate about healing, everybody's saying they're really passionate about having people stay out. We need to design a system that provides that. You have to meet me at my base not meet me on some study that you did in 1990 or, you know, in the early 90s. It, it's not going to work. It's a new day in time. And, and, and it's, 
And we really need to understand the mental capacity of these people coming out. Solidary confinement is a real thing. Sleeping, sleeping in your bed with a knife under your bed is a real thing. And you're sending these people out here in the free world and they don't know nothing but that. So, you know, like the brothers were saying, you know, and they hit it perfect. You, we just need a system that's designed and we really need a system that's really gonna help and meet these brothers and sisters on exactly where they at. Mm. I, there's, um, there's a question in the chat that I think is like pretty relevant to what we're talking about, like transforming systems and thinking about like, all right, this is Aria um, Halden who asks, do you see a merge expanding nationally? And this is something that I've like heard yeah. people ask, like, what would it look like um, for merge to expand nationally and work with organizations with similar objectives? And do you hope to see a merge reach all 50 states one day? Like, what could that look like um, in your in your mind? Alden, I'll let hey, I'll let you go, and then yeah. Reese wants this is, you next. Yeah. This is personal. This is personal. So yeah. So. yeah. Yeah, so we're um so the the reason why emerge works is because we're small. You know, the reason why emerge works is because I know everybody that works at emerge and everybody knows me and everybody we're a family, you know. Um that's why emerge works. Duplication, yes. You know, we're looking to expand to different cities. We've been emerge Connecticut, we've only been in New Haven, we're looking to expand to Hartford, Waterbury, Bridgeport, and so forth, and and other states. Um you know, I think that the trouble with models is there's a lot of good models out there, but it's about culture and you need to protect the culture at all costs. And I think that that's kind of the key to like sustainability of one of these organizations. But I'll be honest, it's a fight just to keep this alive, you know. And so we find ourselves in a, in a position that a lot of nonprofits find themselves under resourced, understaffed. Maurice is a freaking, yeah, I mean, like dude is building bioswales one second, coaching someone the next second, you know, taking someone to an appointment, like it's crazy. And, and so like that we're all switching roles so much and, you know, we love it, but you know, we can't all work 60 hours a week forever. Like, you know, so we need resources, we need funding uh, and we need to be able to grow this out in a way that is, you know, responsive to all the needs of the folks in there and stays in tune with that. Uh, I've seen a lot of nonprofits grow and get diluted and not really still have that same essence. And that's something I'll never sacrifice because that's what makes us all so passionate about this, you know, but we need resources, you know, we need help. What I heard um, is that reentry is, is no cookie cutter to reentry. You can't just have a system designed based on old statistics and somebody studying, um, I think he's going to save a whole bunch of people that went through different experiences, different ways. Um, so like to me, we need a system designed by us for us. And the guidance and support is provided by us. Um, we speak a language that they understand. We can connect on things that some people can't. Um, I remember I had a therapist talking about death of his cat before. I'm like, like what? Like, I was confused. I was never going to therapy after that again. So it's just like little things like that where it's like like supportive guidance provided by your own people for your people. That's what make a family. That's what families do. We see you lacking someone, we're going to help pull you up. We're going to hold you accountable. We can do it in a manner where you can receive it and understand it and provide a place for you to go ahead and grow comfortably to be the best version of yourself. And um, because somebody don't get it right the first time, that don't mean they done. Or the second time. Or the third time. Or sometimes the fourth time. Everybody's going to be in different places. So you got to have that individual who's passionate enough to take to help him with his stuff because his stuff is in order because he's being sustained. That's what the whole point is each one teach one. We got this saying in our culture where I got to want for you what I want for my, I got to want for myself. I got to want for you what I want for myself. But we can't, we shouldn't be around each other. If we ain't walking with the same goals and the same values, it ain't really going to work. And that's a reentry. You get some people that get in over here because you know, or well, the other jobs didn't work out. So now they're doing his job and it's nine to five. We pick our phone up on the weekends for each other. Like we bring each other to appointments that ain't got nothing to do with work. We do it in our personal cars. 
you don't track the mileage of nothing. <laughs> like it's real. So, and you don't get that type of passion from people that ain't been through that. So that's what make us different from everybody. Thanks guys. I like, I have this, first of all, I just love Reese that you brought up the importance of for us by us. And that's like part of your model at Emerge also is like personal development and growing people into the roles where they're then supporting, coaching, working with folks who are coming in new to the organization. And just like also Alden and both you and Alden and Reese talking about the importance of your culture and like how you will never let that, like will not forfeit that for anything. Like that is what makes um, that is what makes Emerge work. I also want to like, in the last few moments, there's this question that we haven't gotten that yet. And there's so many folks who are coming from either Yale or other universities. And like, we've talked a little bit about the, both the blessing and the curse, like not on this call, but in other calls of working with Yale, contracting with Yale. I know that you work with like all sorts of students and folks from the university in different ways. And I just like want to know if you have, if there are um, things that you can share about like the ways that the relationship works and then also like some pitfalls or like things that, right, like make the relationship or like, what is the curse? What is the blessing and the curse part of the relationship with partnering with Yale so that other universities like folks can also be thinking about how they might be supporting an organization like Emerge in their own community. So, sorry, that's a multi-part question, but I hope, did that make sense? Yeah, no, okay. I was hoping we would get to this because I realize we have a lot of students with a lot of passion uh, on this call and I appreciate everybody for sticking around. Um, but Emerge, because we're a small nonprofit, we rely heavily on the human resources available to us. Um, and although Yale is, this sort of like elitist institution uh, in our city and oftentimes can be a scary place for someone who's not part of that community to even be around, right? Because it's dangerous, right? To be from the community on Yale's campus because you're seen as other and there's a lot of issues around that that we could talk about. But on the flip side, there's a lot of brilliant human beings that come through this university and a lot of them are extremely passionate and have gifts that they can bring to the table at a small nonprofit like Emerge, I rely heavily personally on the skills and, um, you know, just time of uh, students. Uh, Xiao is an example, the one who, the young lady who introduced us, um, you know, Xiao put in a lot of time last year on our social media, like helped us through COVID, fundraised for us, like that saved us. We could have potentially lost our company a year ago. I mean, you know, Students have shaped this. Joe Galen, who, who introduced uh, Carol, Joe personally has done more for this organization than almost any human being I've met. Like I owe so much to that individual. And there's so many people before him that have done so much. Um, students using your skills to engage with community nonprofits. Um, and, and I think another question that you were gonna ask Carol, because I saw some of the planning notes, um, was what are some of the pitfalls of it? I've had a lot of rocky experiences working with students as well. Um, you know, uh, students are generally speaking, very um, ambitious. So I've, I've seen students commit to individuals and commit to things. And we made the mistake of sort of like having people work directly with folks coming home, but not being able to really make that commitment because then Midterms come, we can't get a hold of you. Finals come, then you leave for a few months, then summer, then this. And so, um, you know, trying to leverage your, your skills. And that's the culture at Emerge too, is like Reese has inherent skills that he came with, you know, that he's just tapping into every day, you know? And we had to figure out what those were before he could really propel himself to his position that he's in now. Same with Ra, same with, um, an intern that comes in, I got to figure out where my, my needs are, where Emerge's needs are, and where your passion lies and find the intersection between that. So I would just say, don't be afraid to 
get involved at community organizations and try to stay true to yourself and your skills and how your skills can benefit that organization. Because, you know, a lot of nonprofits like ours need help and need capacity building. So students are a huge, huge um, part of this. And then also real quick, Caro is part of URI who was our first customer when we started this years, 10, 11 years ago. And without that business as a, as a construction company, we would not have made it this far. Um, we've planted over 6,000 trees in this city. You know, like we've built, I don't know, Risa tell you how many bioswales we've built. It's, it, we've changed the landscape of this city with, with URI. So that kind of relationship with, with Yale, Yale donated our first truck when we didn't even have a truck. Dan was putting ladders on top of his Honda going to job sites. It was crazy. So Yale has resources and has um, both human resources, contracts, and, you know, in that case, materials uh, that have helped us, um, you know, stay afloat. I thank you, Alden, for, for sharing all that. I just want to say, I'm watching the chat now. There is a lot of love coming in for all three of you, including I want to share one note um, from Varsha Ghosh. She says, hey, from Boston here, I'm so impressed with this program. And as a member of a board of a small community-based nonprofit in Boston, please give to this group, Emerge, um, if you can, every donation counts and no donation is too small. And the link is in the chat. So I just want to lift that up. <laughs> um, and Appreciate. yeah. Um, and yeah, Ra, um, to you. Go ahead, bro. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, like I said, I'm from down South. So I remember always hearing about Yale, but I really never had a understanding of Yale. And I remember I was thinking that, you know, it was going to be kind of excluded from New Haven. It was going to be kind of excluded from everybody else. And it was going to be like a strict, like, like a, this is like a strictly for them and only them type of environment. And then I remember before I came home, just reading about certain people and things I wanted to do as far as like giving back to the community. Like I remember reading about, Angela Davis, and I remember reading about Bobby, and I remember reading about Fred, and I just know I just wanted to do certain things that kind of just gave it, gave it back to the community, to uplift the community. And I remember when I got my opportunity to work for Yale, you know, and Carol, and I felt like I got an opportunity to do that, like planting trees and just bringing neighborhoods, like all of a sudden neighborhoods back to life and just bringing neighborhoods a better sunshine. Like I had, we planted a tree today for somebody who lost their grandmother. And just to see the, the excitement and the joy and the care and just the appreciation, just to come out there and just taking pictures for them, it, melt, it made me feel good because I knew I was not only doing something for the community, I was just bringing joy to somebody else that I don't even know from a can of paint. Never met this woman and her family a day in my life. But just to, just to share that experience with Yale and just to share that experience as far as giving back to my community and bringing joy to somebody brought joy to me. And, you know, that's just one of the blessings that I had that, you know, by me, you know, being a felon, you know, just coming home and then just meeting great people like Carol, great people like Will, so many people at Yale, it, it, just, it just kind of blew my mind because I didn't know what to expect with Dylan with Yale. I'm working with, you know, two students right now designing a great plan for me to launch my own business. And just to see their excitement and just to see their care and just to see their appreciation, and just to see like, yo, rah, I'm with you, da, 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 da. You know, they don't even know me for a can of paint, but this, 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 this receive all that energy and that care and that appreciation. I just, I was just so surprised. I was mind blown. Cause like I said, I just thought, I just thought Yale would just be like only for Yale. So just to see how they'll just extend their hand and then just extend the love to the community, that, that, that's what I want to do with this. It just felt good. It just felt great. I'm just glad. I'm just, gotta, I'm just glad to get proven wrong about mm. Yale. 
that I, I just knew it was just going to be another way. So this to see it this way, it, it felt, you know, it felt much better. I'm glad. Mm. And that, I'm glad to get proven wrong. I appreciate that, Carol. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, our uh, our teammate Will Tisdale, who's come up a few times, he talks about um, building bridges. The work that we do is about building bridges when we're at our best, um, yeah. and and I love that. And I think that what you just shared, Ra, really um, like encapsulates that. Um, and I I mean I can't believe it, but I think we need to end like calm down, wind down the not calm down, wind down um, <laughs> the recorded session. Um, and then there are a lot of folks that are probably going to want to stick around and join us for like more Q and A. Um, there still lots of love emerge for president. Um, Feels like the world would be a better place if everyone could just hear some of this, these wisdoms and truths. Absolutely. This is so important. And everything that you do makes such a difference. You are making waves that need to become tsunamis. Thank you so much for making this difference. Um, so, Appreciate. yeah, this is all from, from folks who are listening in. Um, I also just want to share... Uh, my love for all of you and appreciation um, for having this incredible, honest, open conversation about your experiences, um, the magic that you make happen at Emerge, um, imagining what reentry um, could look like, um, should look like, um, and maybe even imagining a world where reentry is not a thing right where we're like meeting people where they're at and addressing the root causes and there is no more incarceration anymore so um alden and and reese any any last uh any last words before we end the recorded session um i can speak to the yale question a little bit um but i'm gonna speak to the people um at yale not really too much institution um the people at Yale, for some reason, you guys just, um, I did a video with Yale. Um, shout out to Colleen. Um, she actually sat with me and gave me a lot of information so that I could get my point across to my um, digital story that I did. And um, just the uh, the acceptance that comes from uh, the staff, uh, how Matt did with us, um, how Chris did with us, uh, like Carol, you, you already know before even Katie, um, and just the patience that you guys have with us. Um, and like, just the comfort you guys bring, like I remember like even said, like giving the snacks, um, bringing us waters, uh, extra rain gear. Um, and I can think I speak to the guys where we come from, we appreciate everything, even though we hardly accept anything from anybody, but we appreciate it. And that feeling right there is just like coming back, coming home from jail, coming home from prison, um, it does something to you because you, you know, you're being judged. Everybody kind of like edgy around you. Here you are running around with the edge about a yell truck through the city. People seeing you in a different light. It helps to start um, kind of charging that that integrity uh, battery again. Um, Cause you know, we get, we get marginalized so fast and people think that we're unsavory characters because they don't understand um, it. And I can, I can speak to the staff that yeah, I did. And if I didn't, y'all tried to. And that's enough right there. Yeah, I would say one just thing that I think we need to appreciate, because, like, I'm doing a panel discussion in my sweatpants right now. This is 2021. This is yeah. wild. We're sitting in New Haven, Connecticut, but there are people here from California, Iowa. Like, I'm not even through the whole thing. Virginia, like, it's ridiculous. Like, we're talking to people from all over the country. And, you know, for it's this ended 20 minutes ago and there's still 46 people listening. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that because to us, this is like, you know, Reese worked all day, you know, uh, Ra worked all day, Carol worked all day, you know, outside doing all kinds of different things um, in, in the city and training folks that are looking for an opportunity coming home. Um, so, you know, we're doing this, you know, at the end of the night, um, but it's just so humbling to see all this. I'm looking through the chat a little bit right now, and it's wild to see people from all over the world, New Hampshire, 
um, you know, this is, this is wild. So I'm just humbled and, and honored. And, um, you know, that we had the privilege to, uh, hang out with Carol and Reese and Ra and like Dwight Hall and, and just connect with you all virtually. Um, so I, I urge everybody to like reach out to us, figure out ways that we can all continue to have this conversation and, and figure out how we can help each other, you know? That's right. Thank you guys so much. Um, I, this is going to be the end of our recorded session. Um, so again, I want to thank Dwight Hall for hosting Emerge um, and myself to be a part of this conversation. Um, we hope that, yeah, thank you everyone who's tuned in as Alden said, and everyone who will tune in to watch the video um, that's going to be posted on Dwight Hall's website. We hope that you take these learnings, um, all, the, all the knowledge bombs that have been dropped um, uh, by our panelists tonight to your own communities and definitely reach out to Emerge um, and to learn more about what they do and to share your love. So thank you again, um, everyone. And I think we're gonna stop recording now and maybe also stick around for a few more questions um, for folks who, who are still on the call. So thanks.